welcome back. Let's start again. I will now let my colleague Martina Simone introduce the second speaker, Reverend Professor Robert Gall from the Pontificial University of the Holy Cross, who will analyze the concept of ethics and leadership through technology. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, he completed his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at Washington University in St. Louis and worked in Silicon Valley with robotic software for electron beam lithography system. After completing his licentiate in philosophy at the University of Navarre and his doctorate in Rome at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, he did postdoctoral research at the University of Notre Dame and was ordained to the diaconate by Bless Alvaro del Portillo and to the priesthood by St. John Paul II. Gal has published on the narrative structure of the moral life, cognitive behavioral therapy, corporate social behavior, and the social doctrine of Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. In 2018-2019, as visiting faculty research affiliate at Harvard's Human Flourishing Program, he taught courses at Harvard and MIT. He has directed courses on institutional mission at leading healthcare and medical research centers, and on virtuous leadership for Italy Center for Advanced Defense Studies. His current research focuses on intergenerational human flourishing. He recently published The Challenge of Self-Mastery in the Future of Work for the Business and Professional Ethics Journal, and has offered analysis regarding issues of ethics and church affairs for numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, CNN, CBS, BBC, the Associated Press, and Vatican Radio. In addition to Italy and the USA, he has lectured in the Vatican, UK, Spain, Kenya, Ireland, Malta, Czech Republic, Slovenia, and Poland. The floor is yours. Is it? Ah, here we go, here we go. Thank you very much, it's a really, real pleasure to be here. I just arrived from Washington, D.C., where we were getting hit by the tropical storm Ophelia, and it was raining the whole time, and cloudy skies. It's beautiful to be here in Livorno, and I kind of like the fact that my uniform is of the opposite color of many of yours, which hopefully will help to also provoke some debate and some discussion regarding the ideas that I'm going to present. Let's see if this, there we go. Just recently the new iPhone, oops, uh, we went back. Let's see here. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. the beginning. Let's see if, if I can follow through this sequentially. Just uh, 10 days ago, the new iPhone 15 was announced. You might not have noticed that it has a new processor, the A17 Pro, that has new geometries, smaller geometries, as we say in Silicon Valley, three nanometers. I put the question mark there because I'm not really sure. That's what it's advertised as, three nanometers. What that means is that the width of the circuits, the integrated circuits, we call the bridge of the individual switches, of which there are tens of billions of these in that chip, which is the size of your little fingernail, about the size of your little, little fingernail, about the, na small, about the size of a nano SIM card, is this chip, the A17 Pro, and it's system on a chip. The, each one of the circuits has a width of Apparently, they claim three nanometers. So it'd be interesting to reflect about three nanometers, this size, 
in context, context historically, and also in context in this physical universe in which we live. Of course, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. To get some perspective here, a micron is a thousand nanometers. And a piece of human hair is around 60, well, between 40 and 80 microns in width. So when we're dealing with figures like three <laughs> nanometers, this is on the order of splitting hairs around 200 times in order to get to this, this uh, miniaturization. Now, this graph, this may be too detailed for you to see, but you might notice that uh, towards the left, that's meant to indicate a, sper a sperm cell, a human sperm cell. And in the middle, that's, uh, that's shaped like a red blood cell, sort of like an extended donut. And to the right, with those various circles, is indicating the size of viruses, in particular, the HIV virus. But you might notice if you can see the years on there, that the graph begins from around the 1970s and ends in 2017, where you can see the, the size of integrated circuits comes down to. Well, three nanometers were off the chart and were way smaller than a virus, a cell of virus. Now, what this entails, if you've heard of Moore's Law, who was the CEO of Intel Computer. You notice that the, that the line is coming down rapidly, geometrically or exponentially. All of this indicates that as integrated circuits got smaller, their capacity got larger. And that this caused a tremendous acceleration of technology. This acceleration of technology is within the historical context of what is called Industrial Revolution 4.0, of which we are in the midst. And this, I can claim, we are in the midst of not just an acceleration of technological change, but an acceleration of acceleration of technological change. Something like the second derivative of change, whereby everything is happening faster and faster and faster, and that we are in the midst of this, and it is having an impact upon how we understand ourselves, and even upon how our own brains work. In fact, this is a crucial consideration for my entire presentation, that technology affects us intimately. It affects how we understand ourselves. It affects our relationship to tradition. That came up in the question and answer just a few minutes ago. So this uh, graph is meant to summarize. There's a lot of discussion about the details, but more or less, Industrial Revolution 4.0 is the number four on this chart. First one, more or less, people agree, it was a steam engine, more or less, at, towards the end of the 1700s. The cotton gin had a big impact, but certainly the railroad, by with the steam engine, suddenly there was the ability to, in an industrial way, produce objects made of steel and other metals in mass production, which, led, uh, which was necessary in order to be able to produce the rails of the railroad. And then electrification is normally considered to be the second industrial revolution, basic, at the base of the second revolution, industrial revolution towards the late 1800s, which also entailed the ability for the assembly line, and this was very important also in textiles and really across all industries. The idea of each of these revolutions, one, two, three, and four, is that one piece of development in one area caused an acceleration across all areas so that everything took off in a way that was unprecedented in each one of these revolutions. And that each one caused an acceleration of the acceleration of the precedent one. The third was a semiconductor which is a kind of extension of electrification. Because with the semiconductor, we're able to make very small the binary circuits of turning a light switch on or off, so that a semiconductor is 
a very small component which has no moving parts and yet can be moved between the position on or off almost instantaneously. When I say almost instantaneously, the new iPhone uh, 15 runs at a clock rate of 3.2 gigahertz. So that's 3.2 billion times per second, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, which is pretty close to instantaneous. Can be turned on and off, and therefore can be used as a basis of calculations. This led in the 1960s, late 1960s, and then accelerated in the 70s, accelerated again in the 80s, and accelerated again in the 90s. And regarding this, the 80s, it really accelerated due to the Cold War. The US government had a project funded by the Pentagon called VISIC. It's typical in the military, you use acronyms. And VISIC, anybody here heard of VISIC? This is a long time ago. <laughs> It, it's an acronym or an abbreviation for VHSIC, which stands for Very High Scaled Integrated Circuits. So the VISIC program aimed towards developing computers that could be on board a fighter jet such that the aircraft could fly over an enemy base at treetop level just under the speed of sound and could identify enemy targets and direct and launch missiles all at once while passing over the target at close to the speed of sound. To do that requires very rapid calculations. And back in the 1980s, it would, it would have required a computer about a quarter of the size of this room which you wouldn't be able to put on a fighter jet to fly over the enemy base. So the Pentagon said, let's make the computer smaller and smaller so that we can put it on the fighter plane. Well, that was in the 1980s with the Pentagon funding the semiconductor acceleration. In the 1990s, now if you know what really took over the funding, it was the Cold War was over what was really advancing all of the funding in Silicon Valley, instead of the Pentagon, it was video games that really pumped lots of new money into this miniaturization that we saw on, this, on that graph with the sperm cell and the blood cell and the HIV cell, where we could see that every two years, the computers, a chip, had twice as much capacity every two years which means in four years, it has four times as much. In eight years, it has 16 times as much. So it's an exponential growth of capacity. It meant that smaller chips, more capacity, more calculation, faster, less use of energy, because the smaller the integrated circuit, the less energy, so you need less battery power. Everything was advantageous, and the price came down also. But with this number three, Industrial Revolution number three, I mean, I mean to indicate that embedded information and algorithms, meaning that human thought is embedded in the semiconductor. And this is a crucial feature of the third Industrial Revolution. Well, the fourth Industrial Revolution, with the acceleration of the acceleration, cybernetics is characterized by distributed networks which means that instead of simply having a device that is smart, you have a device that is smart that's connected to a network of other smart devices so that they can learn from one another and that these embedded information and algorithmic systems are all connected and speaking to one another. This is necessary, for instance, in order to have an Uber come and pick you up whereby you can calculate where the drivers are, where, the, where the, the available cars, where the riders, and you can determine the pricing model instantaneously according to this distributed network. Many consider that this development in technology is impacting us in such a way that our humanity is changing and that we are, this is driving us towards 
some form of either transhumanism, meaning integrating new capacities in ourselves such that our nature is changed. Think, for instance, of Elon Musk's Neuralink project, which is why I bring up post-humanism. Post-humanism is a transformation of our humanity such that we are entirely different. There is no longer human, but something beyond human. Many uh, consider that this is leading to the irrelevance of the human being. This is developed within the context of what's called the future of work, wherein the idea is, well, we can replace humans with robots that will do the work for us, so why do we even need human beings on this planet? In fact, human beings are an impediment. <clears throat> when I worked in Silicon Valley, I did quite a bit of software testing in a clean room, and in a clean room where all of the particles, microsco microscopic particles, even sub-microscopic particles, are filtered out, it's a real problem to have humans in a clean room. Because humans, we are constantly producing, I could say, shedding cells, saliva, and so forth. Every time we breathe, our hair is falling out, so you have to wear something on your head, stuff off your skin, you scratch yourself, and it will totally ruin a chip because the cells that fall off our body are way bigger than those circuits. So not only are humans irrelevant, but it might seem that we are a disturbance, we are an obstacle for development and for technology. So does this mean that if we are irrelevant that we should be enslaved somehow? For instance, right now there are many who are discussing self-driving autonomous vehicles and claim that very soon, if not already, it's the case that autonomous vehicles are much safer than human-driven vehicles, so it should be prohibited to have any human at the steering wheel because human beings are dangerous, let's replace them with machines that are connected to the network, that are much more informed. There's already plans for highway construction such that certain lanes will have prohibited from human drivers, but all of them will allow autonomous driving vehicles. In response to this, I would say, threat to our humanity of transhumanism, posthumanism, or the irrelevance and enslavement of humans, is the challenge of self-mastery. The challenge of self-mastery is the idea that there's something precious in the universe, in us, that is the capacity for freedom, and that only us have freedom, and that we should be considered at the top and the pinna pinnacle of our cosmos. This kind of consideration goes way back to at least the third century BC. I think it's interesting to consider among the Stoics, who are very popular today, Epictetus, who is, the, the pronunciation in Italian is interesting, Epiteto, who is uh, Epictetus in his Enchiridion or Manual, proposes an understanding of human freedom, which is a possibility and it's become very popular you notice from this quotation from Epictetus, he proposes that we restrain our desire in order to liberate ourselves, such that you only desire things that are under your own interior control, under your own power. In this way, you avoid disappointment by not being susceptible to those things that are extrinsic to yourself. Therefore, Epictetus comes to this radical conclusion, which you also find in authors like Seneca. He says, if you embrace your child or your wife, that you embrace a mortal, and thus if either of them dies, you can bear it. The idea is, when you embrace your child, your wife, your spouse, you embrace someone whom you love, imagine that they're not someone you love. Detach yourself from that love. Become indifferent to all love, and then you will be free. He continues, developing this idea of freedom from the perspective of drama, of theater, 
of a story. Remember that you are an actor in a drama of such sort as the author chooses. The implication here, and this is indicated by the translation, that author here is in capital letters to indicate that the author is not you. If the story is short, then you live a short one. You may be dying tomorrow, maybe this afternoon. If long, then in a long one. If it be his pleasure, the author's pleasure, that you should enact the role of a poor man, or a cripple, or a ruler, or a private citizen, see that you act it well. For this is your business, to act well the given part, but to choose it belongs to another. Notice again that Epictetus has an understanding of freedom such that you are not in control. You must abide by that which is determined from outside of you. You may notice already from my description that I do not find this to be an attractive answer to the challenge of the acceleration the acceleration. In fact, Epictetus emphasizes apatos and atarasia, which is to be apathetic, indifferent, disinterested in all affairs so that we can be free. Is this the solution to human freedom? Is this the solution to leadership? Should leadership decide that, somehow advancing without my request, here we are. Should leadership be such that we are in the hands of another, that we are all in the hands of another, we are in the hands of the machines, the robots, that we hand over control to them? Is that what leadership consists in? Or does leadership consist in acting according to right reason, some special capability that we have that no one else has, no one else has, and no thing has? So life, human life, is, and here I'm drawing from Aristotle, it's to live a story, a big action. But Epictetus asks us about who is the author, who's really in charge. Here's Aristotle from Raphael's famous School of Athens painting that's in the Vatican Museum. Here we move very quickly from Aristotle to Damien Fair, who's at Ohio State University in Ohio. Who's, he's a neuroscientist and cognitive psychologist. And in this academic journal that is a kind of meta journal called the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS, in 2017, he made this amazing declaration. <clears throat> the human capacity to maintain task goals selectively attend to relevant information and avoid distraction is unrivaled. Now, what does he mean by unrivaled? I submit that he means here by unrivaled, that truly unrivaled, that there is nothing greater in the universe, that within this entire cosmos, this entire world, the greatest thing is the capacity that we have to pay attention, to, to develop goals, objectives, and to pursue them and to direct others towards them, and to be able to disattend to things that are not related to our project, and to attend to the relevant information, and therefore to avoid distraction. Notice that this is very much challenged by new technology, like the cell phones that we probably all have in our pocket, that every time we hear it buzz or we feel it vibrate, it causes a dopamine surge in our neurons. Are you free? Are you able to stay, pay attention to the task at hand in order to seek your, object, your objective? The famous psychologist who did the work at Stanford uh, that is commonly recognized as the marshmallow test, which I don't have time to go into now, wrote this amazing statement that so much research today has exploded. There's also an acceleration of an acceleration of research in the area of cognitive psychology. Having to do with executive function, this ability to direct ourselves and other things towards an end, an end that we decide that we want to pursue. There's been so many breakthroughs in neuroscience just in the past few years that we are able to understand 
how the brain works to make it harder or easier to exercise self-control. Self-control is self-mastery. Self-control is needed to be free. He says this, in a, this is an enormously exciting time within the science of understanding. In order to deepen the way relationships between mind, brain, and behavior act, to ask the important questions. How can you regulate yourself and control yourself in ways that make your life better? I'd say there's even a deeper question, which is, can you do that? Is that even possible for any of us? Or are we controlled by that which is extrinsic to us? If we are living in the metaverse, maybe we're being controlled by the metaverse. If we're living in a universe of truth, of reality, you might think that we have to adapt ourselves, conform ourselves. Or you could also think that we should transform this reality into something more amenable to our ideals, our pursuits, our desires, our goals. So here's a shift in my presentation in which I'd like to speak of these four areas of development that are interrelated. And this may be the first time that this is publicly being presented of these four being interrelated. And there's the positive psychology that arose in the 1980s, positive epidemiology that is arising in the past 10 years, including its area of research in social science called human flourishing, and a development that's also out of Harvard that's called optimal work. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania was the president of the American Philosophical Association when he proposed that psychology should shift its focus from treating mental illness to promoting mental health and should therefore focus on positive psychology. One of his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, who has this name that's kind of difficult to pronounce, his first name is Micheli, and his last name is Csikszentmihalyi. It's actually Mihaili Csikszentmihalyi. Is his, is his full name? He's a Hungarian, and he promoted this theory of flow, which is this ability to direct ourselves in excellence in practice to achieve creativity and well-being. <clears throat> his most famous book is called Flow. But in that book, Mihaili Csikszentmihalyi affirms that repression is not the way to virtue. When people restrain themselves out of fear, their lives are diminished. Only through freely chosen discipline, meaning that it's chosen for a purpose that we're free to choose, can life be enjoyed and still kept within the bounds of reason. Repression could be related to Epictetus, thinking that I ought to repress my desires. Instead, Mihaili Csikszentmihalyi says that we ought not to repress our desires, but rather emphasize strategically what we're aiming for so that we can perform executive function and direct ourselves and direct others. Tyler Vanderweel, who is a professor of epidemiology in Harvard's Chan School of Public Health and won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Statistics, is also the director of the program of human flourishing at Harvard. And he is developing a new sector within epidemiology that normally studies how illness is spread throughout a community to promote how well-being, human flourishing, is contagious through a community, through an organization, through a society. So we could call this positive epidemiology whereby he's able to demonstrate, he has demonstrated, that human flourishing is not something that can be achieved on one's own, but only in a community. This seems to contrast directly with Epictetus, because for Epictetus, one experiences freedom by liberation of one's own passions from within, while not desiring anything with respect to anyone else. Instead, Tyler Vanderweel demonstrates that for us to find happiness, well-being, and flourishing, we must live within a community of goal orientation whereby we experience teamwork, where we rely upon one another. Dr. Kevin Majors, also at Harvard University, professor of psychiatry and clinical psychiatrist, 
with his optimal work also extends this idea of human flourishing to appreciate how we can exercise this self-control not through repression but through reframing by focusing on our ideals of service. Joko Willink, former special ops U.S. military veteran, well he's still a veteran, wrote a book called Extreme Ownership and he's also a kind of a famous podcaster and engages in martial arts and kind of uh, human well-being. Well, Joko Willink proposes an extreme ownership that by emphasizing within a community, within an organization, including within the military, that you are in charge, it's your responsibility, allows you to take the initiative and to act creatively. So that if your superior entrusts you with a project and that you share the same goals with your superior, then you can be free and creative. From this perspective of extreme ownership, obedience to one's superior, when you adhere to the same ideals, accentuates human freedom. And it accentuates our liberation from that enslavement that I referred to at the beginning of my presentation. This leads to an idea of organizations that we can call the inverted pyramid. Instead of thinking of there's one guy on top and he directs the people on the bottom what to do, you, s you consider that the guy on top is actually serving everybody else so that the one who's really making the decisions is the whole group. It's more bottom up rather than top down as an organization structure. All of this entails this bigger picture of what life are we living? Well, you can read a story you can watch a story being portrayed in a Hollywood movie, and it may be a very fine spectacle. But even better, and in fact the basis for all stories written in the pages of a book, and for all Hollywood movies, is the story that you are living now, and that I am living now, of which each of us is a protagonist, and perhaps also the author. Epictetus said, you're not the author. But what if we take charge? And we become also the author. I would say at least the co-author. As you might imagine, from my uniform, I believe that there is someone providentially designing this whole universe. According to my convictions, he looks upon us with love from all eternity. And he has a loving design for us, and that we can participate in that design because we can share in his nature. This isn't just a basis of religious belief, it's not just based in religious belief, but there's also philosophical bases for this kind of consideration. In any case, if you are the protagonist and author of your story, then everything depends upon achieving your end. John Lasseter, who was the director of Pixar and created uh, these great Hollywood success animated movies like Toy Story, and uh, Encanto, and other such, uh, I think, masterpieces. Oh, The Incredibles, I think, is a great masterpiece of, of Hollywood. He said the story is king. Now, can you identify John Lasseter in this photograph? You might notice there's someone else in the photograph who's pretty famous, Buzz Lightyear. And he says, uh, he says, go to infinity. No, he says, towards infinity and beyond which is a deep philosophical proposition, <laughs> which I think is much better than Epictetus. In fact, it's related to Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle actually lived prior to Epictetus. He wasn't a Stoic. He's his own, you know, relying upon Plato and Socrates, but he devised his own sy system for philosophy. He wrote the first manual of ethics ever. He said the end is the most important thing of all in action and in a story. That's from his Poetics, which is the first systematic analysis of stories. And then he said, the end is everywhere in the story. If you're living the story, that means the end is everywhere in your life. When you get up in the morning, when you have lunch, when you take a break, when you're working, when you feel tired, but you continue working, the end is everywhere in the story. Now, there's this baseball player who became a sports commentator, very famous on TV. That's a picture of him when he was younger and he was playing uh, baseball, he's a famous catcher. 
He's uh, fam he's, there have been philosophical studies of his aphorisms, like this one. If you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. So if you are going somewhere, I suppose it's a good idea to be going somewhere. You might want to think about where you're going, otherwise you might not get there. <laughs> now, here's a little shift in my presentation, which has to do with stress. And this is the reason why I bring it up here. It's deeply related to self-direction, human freedom, the challenge of self-mastery. Because do we experience stress as something that's just imposed upon me, that happens to me, the way Epictetus would see it? Or instead, am I in charge of my life? And when I experience stress, do I remain in charge? Well, there used to be a lot of literature that said that stress was lethal, that it caused, causes cardiovascular disease. But there's also been a change of paradigm in this area, just the past 15 years. This lady here is Kelly, Kelly McGonigal, and she's a professor of psychology at Stanford University. And she has this magnificent TED talk called Make Stress Your Friend. And she published this book, The Upside of Stress. I highly, highly recommend the TED talk. The book is okay. The TED talk is magnificent. Notice from this picture of the brain, remember Walter Michel said there's all this development in the area of brain science. If you notice the blue area, which is shaped like an almond, that's called the amygdala, it's right at the center of the brain, between our ears, between the front and the back. And in that pink and red area, especially the pink area, that's the prefrontal cortex. These two components of the brain are crucial to understand to direct ourselves because we feel basic inputs, sensations like I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm tired. Any kind of desire like I'm thirsty. We experience that at first in the amygdala. <clears throat> Whereas when we're thinking about how am I going to get there, how am I going to get my team there? How am I going to get a thousand men and women together in order to direct this ship, to pilot it towards the port? That's the prefrontal cortex in the front of the brain, under our forehead. It turns out that in, from evolutionary biology, we have pretty much in common the structure and the activity of the amygdala with a lizard. So it goes way back in the evolutionary chain. Whereas what we have in the prefrontal cortex, this ability to executively direct action among a, uh, a community, is very new in the evolutionary development. Only a few primates have it, and we have it way more developed than any other animal. And it's indicative of how we are special in the universe. So what Kelly McGonigal makes a point that stress is deadly, but only if you fear it. If, on the other hand, you experience stress as an acceleration of the beating of the heart that is analogous to joy or the experience of facing a challenge, inner courage. Then we can, from the perspective of the neurohormones, appreciate that, yes, stress causes secretion of adrenaline, but also causes secretion of oxytocin, so long as we experience stress within the context of a community that is facing stress together. So that if we experience stress not selfishly, egocentrically, but together with others, then it leads to happy health and well-being, not death. Stress becomes positive. So here are three ways of developing self-mastery. First, reframe. Reframe is get yourself out of the Epictetus' slavery and instead consider where you're going and direct everything to where you're going. Be mindful, be aware of your feelings and embrace the challenge of overcoming those fe feelings or to direct yourself and your community towards the end while experiencing stress as an opportunity to grow in all the virtues. So embrace the challenge for yourself and for your community, your organization. In fact, Kelly McGonigal concludes her TED Talk in answer to a question with this marvelous affirmation. Chasing meaning is better for your health than trying to avoid discomfort. Go after what creates meaning in your life and then trust yourself to handle the stress that follows, especially if you do so in community. In Aristotle's ethics, the Nicomachean ethics, in book 10, right towards the end, he speaks of what really makes us happy, what really causes human flourishing. And he says that it is to act in accordance with virtue. And virtue is to be reasonable in our activity, to act according to reason, and that the highest virtue 
is to act according to something which is divine in us, that is God-like. And that is by, you could call it Sophia, wisdom. It is contemplation. Andrew Huberman, who's also become a very famous podcaster and is also at Stanford University where he's a professor of neuro-ophthalmology, has recently offered videos in which, and explanations where he advances the benefits of meditation, which is very much like that Aristotelian contemplation. Consider what you live for. Consider what kind of story you want to live. Dedicate maybe 17 minutes. That's what he proposes every morning. And by doing so, you will reconfigure your brain in such a way that you can be liberated from feelings that are contrary to your own objectives. I want to show, oh, we should have uh, audio here, but we can't hear the audio. I want to show this little clip from Gladiator. Is there a way that we can pipe in the audio? This little clip from Gladiator includes a quotation from Marcus Aurelius, uh, another Stoic. And uh, Russell Crowe, as you can see here, but we can't hear him. Uh, Russell Crowe speaks in Latin. He says one word in Latin which signals to the viewer that he's quoting from Marcus Aurelius, who's dressed in blue right at the beginning of this. But we seem to have trouble with the audio. Um, the secret would be if you come out of the slideshow, do you know how to do that? And you, should I come there? <laughs> and you select the audio. Parlo in italiano, eligi l'audio? Sorry for this little, uh, we're very close to the end of my presentation. Start thinking about a question because we're very close to the end. Let's see if we can get this audio. It's kind of a fun scene. Oh, that, that's the conclusion. <laughs> Maybe we should just go without Gladiator unless we can. So the, the very, let's, let's just skip this slide. Just, we could just stop it here. But you can enjoy watching Russell Crowe and this uh, fierce looking dog. He's about to go into battle. And as he's about to go into battle, he's leading his men. And he says, fratres. This is in the, in the original English. Uh, which is this indication that he's quoting from Marcus Aurelius. And he enunciates from Marcus Aurelius some of the components of what is today considered mindfulness and cognitive psychology. And then he says, what can you my crops. Imagine where you will be, and it will be so. Hold the line. Stay with me. If you find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face, do not be troubled, for you are in Elysium. 
So, so there you go. Those are the words from Marcus Aurelius and uh, played by Russell Crowe. He says, hold the line. He says, imagine where you will be tomorrow and it will be so. This is not just power of positive thinking, but is directing oneself and the others as a team in the face of stress towards the end. This apse of uh, recently restored is from Cefalu. Panto Crator is what it's called. It's in Sicily. Magnificent piece of art from the 12th century, from around 1140, which represents the Son of God made man. Panto Crator means not the creator of all things, some think, but the ruler over all things. To rule is to exer exercise mastery, dominion, kingship. The implication is not only that Jesus Christ is the king, but that you, insofar as you are called to live a life that is divine, are also called to live and direct things according towards an ideal, towards the truth, towards the good, towards the beautiful, and to lead others to do so. I'd love to go on regarding that, but we've, I've already taken up a lot of your time. I look forward to a discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gal, for sharing your valuable insight on the risk and crisis of uh, leadership. Leaders should know how to, cry, to minimize the crisis, uh, to the, the damage, uh, in order to. Uh, your speech provides us a valuable ideas uh, to um, dealing with such a delicate topic. So now, if there are any questions for you, uh, please stand up, and so we provide you a microphone. Good morning, Professor. I'm the Ensign Benzefour, and um, my question is uh, how the uh, decision-making process is uh, influenced by the integration of uh, the think te technology um, uh, into the leadership uh, roles, and if there are some tools that can be used uh, in, in order to give priority to uh, ethical uh, consideration. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good, great question. Regarding technology and decision making, it's crucial to make it such that technology doesn't control us, but that we control the technology. That the technology is used for our good, for our aims, for our ideals. And only this is the ethical situation. If we presume that the technology is going to take over and make decisions for us, then we will be enslaved by technology. Now, if we consider this at a deeper level, we can recognize I brought up autonomous cars, self-driving cars. Of course, we need to put in the cars algorithms to make them drive themselves safely, but we're in charge as we determine those algorithms. So we give priority to protecting human safety in those algorithms because human beings have this special privileged position within the entire universe. And therefore humans, whether they're small children, the elderly, the infirm, are to be respected. And we must design technology in order to assist us in protecting and respecting all humans. This is true in self-driving cars, it's true in medicine, it's true in research. We must not allow ourselves to be enslaved by the technology. Let me challenge you. What makes you think that we, are, that we, the human, have a special place in the universe? Who tell us? Of course, this is the central question. And thank you, Admiral. This is the central question, and I based it upon Damien Fair's scientific recognition that the ability 
to maintain focus on our task and to direct that task towards the goal and to establish that goal is unrivaled, it's unprecedented, it's nowhere else in the universe. And it's the same consideration that Aristotle makes when at the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics he compares the human being to other animals that are alive and he considers that being alive is better than not being alive <laughs> or being dead. And we are at the height of all life because compared to other animals, we are capable of knowing our aim and directing ourselves towards it. There's a lot of debate around technology and if technology is capable of self-consciousness, self-awareness. Famously, recently, an engineer at Google resigned because he said that an AI system that he was designing was becoming self-conscious. I don't think this is possible because, and here following Aristotle, I think that self-consciousness requires a mindful capability that is without matter, that doesn't require matter. And Aristotle says that the human intellect demonstrates immateriality by the fact that we can consider at once opposites and that there's no limit to our human understanding. We can consider dark and bright. We can consider truth and falseness, good and evil at the same time, which indicates that we're not using a chip. We're not simply, we are using an organ, but it's not limited to the organ. We're using our brain. And in our brain and in our retina, you can't see dark and bright at the same time in the same way in the same place. In fact, this is the first principle of human reason, according to Aristotle, what he calls the principle of non-contradiction, that something cannot be at once and not be in the same way at the same time. And yet our minds can consider that and can come up with the principle. And therefore, he says, we are unique in the universe, and therefore we must not allow ourselves to be subservient or enslaved by technology. Only us have the capability of self-consciousness. So if some machine does demonstrate this, this is presented in Hollywood, for instance, Blade Runner or Blade Runner 2049 presents humanoids replicants that are made in a lab that demonstrate self-consciousness. They demonstrate love. They demonstrate freedom. I haven't seen such a thing in the real world. If it happens, I think we should respect it the way we respect humans. Would you like to follow up? So for, or for me, the, it's, a, it's, an, it's a process of reason to claim that there's something special and unique regarding self-consciousness, freedom, and the ability to know and to be self-conscious that we know. Not only to know, but to know that we know. A dog recognizes a rabbit as food, but it doesn't know that the rabbit is food. It doesn't have a choice. It's going to go and chase the rabbit. We have a choice. And you can look at food and be very hungry and say, I'm not going to eat it. This is, a, this is an act of reason. The question, could something develop in the universe? Like, can we develop self-consciousness in AI or in some robot? I think it's also an act of reason, of intellect, to say that this is impossible if it's merely material because the material is either on or it's off. This is true about every one of those 100 billion transistors in the A17 Max Pro inside the new iPhone. It's either on or it's off. But our minds consider can, can hold at once, on and off. And therefore, we, we're free. For me, I guess it's an act of faith, although I'm not sure that my faith actually claims this. I don't know that there's no other possibility. I don't think that's been taught by the church, but I'm convinced that 
we're unique in the universe, exceptional. But I'm open to seeing if there's something that will come along, we should examine it carefully. There are interesting um, sci-fi, um, science fiction novels about this. One of the most interesting that's had a big impact, it's called A Canticle for Leibovitz, written by an American situated in Italy. Uh, it's, um, it brings up this issue, whether or not, let's say, an extraterrestrial or a machine or a mutant is not generated from a human being and yet demonstrates freedom, self-awareness, and knowledge. If that were to happen, we should respect it. Thank you. So the last question. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Gall. Jacoby Rice from, Ensign Jacoby Rice from the uh, United States Naval Academy. So you mentioned self-mastery, stress. Um, I would like to know as leaders, how would we be able to implement practices by our enlisted um, to practice self-mastery and mindfulness as stress is a big problem in our fleet, and I'm sure it is in many other fleets as well. Th thank you. This is really, cr really, really crucial, and it's related to a topic that I would love to go into more, <laughs> but there was, wasn't time, which is further development of the feature of contagion, and it's how would you experience in your mind you're communicating to those around you. There's amazing literature about this. Some scientists call it amygdala hijack, which is where somebody next to you, their amygdala gets all excited, and this contagious into your amygdala and takes over your mind. Typical example of this, it's not the military world, but we can all appreciate it, is between spouses that one of them becomes very angry. This is showed in the movie A Marriage Story with Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver that uh, magnificently portray a husband and a wife that are having a feud. They love each other, but they become very angry and upset with one another. And the more angry the one is, the more angry the other becomes. The same is true about stress. If we handle stress with fear, we communicate that to the others around us without even saying anything. They can feel it when you feel it. If we experience stress as an opportunity for growth in teamwork, the others around you will feel that too. A great way of practicing this is through team sports, like a football team going into a big game. You saw that I studied at Notre Dame. I, 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 was, very I was following on Saturday the Notre Dame-Ohio State uh, game, which is this big football game on Saturday. And it went down to the last three seconds. So the quarterback going into that last play, it was actually won by running back, the game. If he communicates to the others, we're in this together, we're going to do it. They have clear what their goal is. They have clear what their mission is. They're acting together. It becomes exciting, fun, a challenge, an opportunity for growth. Aristotle described it that way. Damien Fair describes it this way. This needs to be lived this way in all organizations, including in the military, in the Navy, to embrace the challenge and to help the others in your team to do so also. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Gall. Thank you. So now we will take a five minutes break, but please stay in your seats and don't leave the room. Thank you.